and we greet those who join us by means of live stream also. A good time of fellowship we're looking forward to. This will be our 79th exposition of the book of Genesis. We're drawing to a close of this book now. It's important to keep all the perspectives that we've been developing through it. We're going to be covering the first 15 verses of chapter 49 tonight. <clears throat> and Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to my father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up on my couch. Simeon and Levi, our brethren, instruments of cruelty are their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret. Under their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce. And their wrath for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, thou art he whom my brethren, thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall a gathering of the people be, binding his foal under the vine, and his ass's colt under the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be an haven of ships, and his borders shall be unto Zidon. Issachar is a strong ass, couching between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good, and the land that was it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. Amen. Amen. Well, that wasn't something said off the cuff, was it? <clears throat> this is one of the extended prophecies, early prophecies of Scripture delivered by a man. Most prophecies, with the exception of Joseph's, were delivered by men, but this this was uh, well by God, but this was delivered by men. And I want to say a word about the nature of prophecy because I don't think it's understood very well. And there's a lot of prophecy in Genesis, so that's why I'm I'm doing this. So I'll do my best to define what prophecy is and why there is such a thing as prophecy. First of all, it must be remembered that one of the primary reasons or purposes for Scripture is to reveal the nature of God. Because man of himself can't conceive of a God that's separate from himself. This is, uh, this is not possible. I don't think probably this probably wasn't possible in an unfallen state either. That's why man left to himself changed the glory of God, because he wasn't capable of 
even imagining uh, the true God. It, it's it's tra See, man can't think outside his, the realm of human experience. They're limited. They're limited to things that happen in the world and their experience. That's that's the limit border. So he changed the glory of God into the image made like to corruptible man, and even descended into birds and four-footed beasts and creep even creeping things. <laughs> So I said that man changed the glory of God. Even though nature did testify to the power and Godhead or divinity of God, it was like God's thumbprint was on creation, but men didn't see it. Nobody saw it. Even though they were ordained of God knew they wouldn't see it, but they were to kind of reach, probe for it, grope for it. But man uh, drifted so far from the original consciousness of God, how we don't know very little about how extensive that was, but that God had to make himself known. I doubt very much that Adam knew very much about God. That's not that's my opinion. I do reserve the right to be wrong on that, but that's my opinion. He didn't know very much about God himself, only what he had made known to him. That's all. This side of the cross, we've learned a lot. See, sometimes people read the of these old saints and they forget <laughs> how limited they were. So God began, you might call it an educational program, to teach men about God. Now, some of the primary things we've learned that heathen gods, they don't know this yet, that God is a God of thought. Wow, that's, see, that's a... Yeah. Heathen gods, they aren't gods of thought. There are no books. Heathen, right. There's no heathen God that authored a book. Yeah. It's a God of purpose. We learn that about him, purpose. And he's a God of precision. He's a God of wisdom. He's a God of power. These are things God has taught men. They didn't know this up after the fall. He's a God that's interested in the welfare of humanity. He's a God who offers incentives through promises. He's that kind of God. He wants to be known, totally unlike any other man-made God. He's a God who does impossible things. He's a God whose will cannot be overturned. He's a God to whom men are responsible. That's just a few things. That God has revealed over the process of time, he's revealed. Now, prophecy has to do with that. Prophecy is one of the fundamental ways God reveals himself. So I want to make an effort here to define what prophecy is. Prophecy begins with a divine objective. It's more than predicting the future. Amen. Or what's going to happen in the future, what's going to happen. Or beholding what's going to take place down there. That's, that's not what prophecy yeah, is. Right. Human prophecy, that's what they... That, so that's their idea, but this is not prophecy. It's not the employment of what we call prescience. He sees what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what. I see it down there. I see down in the future. I see what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. That's not, that's not what starts yeah. prophecy. While God, God does see everything, but that's not the basis for prophecy. Prophecy begins with a divine objective, something God's purpose to do, the thing he's purpose could not possibly have been conceived by any other being. And prophecy is telling people what he's going to do. Amen. Yeah. Now in this, I have a little chart here. It was largely for my benefit to kind of encapsulate it. It starts out with an objective and then he manages everything that's connected with that objective being realized. 
the prophecy spoken at the right time, and then the causes are managed. The time is managed. As time progresses, that time is managed. Yeah. Things are coordinated that, ha that have to do with this prophecy. God, co it's not that they just fell together. And God coordinates everything. Yeah. God announces signs when it's about to happen. Then the, his prophecy is fulfilled. The objective is realized and God gets the glory. See, that's kind of a snapshot view of prophecy. Now, in managing the time, because he manages the time associated with his prophecies, we have expressions like this, the fullness of the time, see? The time is fulfilled, signs of the times. The times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Times of the restitution of all things. The times before appointed, fully come, shall come to pass. See, those would you could not say that if God was not managing the time. Yes, amen. He's managing the time. And he's he's coordinating the events connected with that time. For example, when the deliverance of Israel from Egypt do an area involved the coordination of the people of Israel, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's counselors, the Egyptians, the presence of Moses and Aaron, the exponential growth of the number of Israelites, and probably a whole lot more. Yeah. It all had to be yeah. coordinated. The approaching signs, they were managed by God. Whenever anything significant was approaching, he'd he put a heads up type sign. Some people would see it and some wouldn't. Some of these approaching signs, they involve people like Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth, Zacharias, the taxation of Caesar, Augustus, the shepherds, Herod, S Simon, Simeon, Anna, the wise men. You see it right, they were all like Little little announcers. They were like little megaphones saying the time is coming near. When prophecies are fulfilled, the purpose of God is fulfilled and He's He is glorified. Now I listed I'm not I'm not gonna read these through page five <clears throat> the prophecies that have been made known in thus far in Genesis. So there's a significant number of them. Now let's, th let's take a quantum leap and consider the prophecies concerning the Savior that have been given. <clears throat> the first was delivered to Satan in the presence of Adam and Eve that he would brew, the, the coming seed of woman would bruise he says seed of woman because every other man's a seed of man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think knows this, but I thought I'd say it anyway. <laughs> man is this, the seed is from man. Mm -hmm. The woman conceives, but the seed is from man. But in this case, the seed is the woman. Yeah, yeah. She's a seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. To Abraham, he said, in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. He repeated that several times. I'm I'm showing what was known of the coming, what was made known of the coming seed. To Abraham, he said that all the nations of the earth be blessed. To Isaac, he said the uh, same thing. To Jacob, he said the same thing. So at this point in human history, people knew three things about the coming Christ. Now, we are talking about a period of time that was 2,318 years. Huh? Here's what was known. The seed of the woman. We knew that. 
Now that nothing more was said for 2,071 years. For 2,071 years, that's it. That's, that yeah. is it. That's the sum total of everything God made known about the coming Savior. For over 2,000 years, that's all that was known. Yeah. Then after 2,000 years, the, that he would bless all families of the earth. That was, that was made known. Then another 247 years passed. And in our text, Jacob made known unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Yeah. So that's the three things. Yeah. In 2,300 years, those are the three things. Now, on your own, you can just try to list it out. Just try to list first just by memory. Yeah, and you'll come up with a lot. What you know about Christ, and then you remember that up to the time of our text, that's all that they knew. That's it. That's all they knew. How do we account for something like this? Well, first of all, this was of such magnitude that Paul tells us, he quotes from Isaiah, that it had not entered into the heart of man, that is, he, that is man was incapable of knowing what he needed or what God would do. It had entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for them that love him. This was because of the impact of sin, and it, it happened, apparently it happened almost instantly. The impact of sin, it transcends all human reasoning. No matter how long you be spend thinking about this, you will sense there's a lot more to this than I'm seeing. The damage sin did to humanity. The damage one sin did to humanity. One, one mm -hmm. sin did this. Hmm? In the next generation after Adam, I'm, I, there was murder. It, I'm going to say things begin. They, they, they lost their understanding of God, and so as soon as that was lost, sin. Amen. See, it's just like this. If, if the knowledge of God goes down, sin goes, Amen. goes up. The knowledge of God goes up, sin goes down. Just it's, it's that way. It's, it's, that's how it works. So murder was committed, but the next time murder is committed, two people were killed. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. They may kill two people, and then it continued to escalate till finally God yeah. destroyed all flesh. Uh -huh. See, knowledge of God low, committing of sin high. The point is that men became more enslaved to sin and less intelligent about God. It just, whenever sin moves up, the knowledge of God moves down. Yeah. I mean, you can't stop it. You can't stop this from happening. A person can't sin increase and they say, well, I've been going to church all my life. I know a lot about, no, their knowledge went down. And he, even their memory should tell them this. It took now. It took God longer to establish in men an accurate concept of God than, than we can understand. This accounts for the relative infrequency of God's inner involvements with men during its early history. Just once in a while, he'd talk to somebody and tell them something, but it was kind of rare. Is because before God can have communication, profitable communication with men, they have to have a, a further understanding of God. Yeah. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say that our generation is not capable of knowing very much about God. Uh -huh. yeah. Even if God dumped it out by the barrel falls, uh -huh. it wouldn't be comprehended. That's why he's not dumping it out. Yeah. You, you take your own life, you examine it, and you will find that there's a direct correlation between what you know about God and how devoted you've been to him. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. There'll be a direct correlation between the two. Amen. You will not pick up on an understanding of God if your life is sloppy. Mm -hmm. It just won't happen. I'm accounting now for prophecy and why this took quite a while. Quite a while. 
for man to come up to speed. Now, because of this, put, you got to put yourself back in these times now when not much is known about God. The prophets told about his purpose, and they enlarged on it some, but it was hard for people to grasp. But the prophets, they said that when this time came of the Messiah, or when Shiloh comes, this is in our text, or when the seed comes, or when Abraham's seed comes, they said it was going to be unparalleled abundance. They made a, made a point of saying this. And I'm going to make a point of saying where that's abundance is not found, mm -hmm. the blessing hasn't come. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I will take uh, some samples of this. Here's Psalm 36, 8. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt make them drink from the river of thy, ple thy God's pleasures. Mm -hmm. They shall go from strength to strength, every one of them. How many? Every one of them Amen. in Zion appeareth before God. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of the Lord. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourish. You see, this is the age. Now he's telling you. Yeah. This is prophecy. He's telling you. This is how you'll know the real things here. Yeah. I will restore health unto thee. I'll heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they call thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, which no man seeketh after. I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness. My people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. I'll feed them with good pasture. Well, I don't have to read the rest of it. It was a period of absolute abundance. And anyone that is stupid enough to say that anything like this exists on any measurable scale anywhere in the world or that it has existed for hundreds of years is just misinformed. You got to read the Bible to find examples of this. Yes, there have been renewals. Yes, there have been revivals, but not like the book of Acts. Yeah. And there are still revivals like this going on, but not like the book of Acts. Amen. Yeah. It's greatly reduced. Uh -huh. And most of the people in the wake of these revivals are spiritual simpletons. Uh -huh. I've been involved in some of them. The people were genuine, but they were babes. They weren't fakes. Uh -huh. I'm not, they weren't frauds, but they were babes. But that you don't get babes out of these texts. <laughs> uh -huh. That's what he's going to produce, in other words. Uh -huh. All right, having said that, now we're go we'll go to Jacob's prophecies. Jacob called his sons. He senses his departure is near, but he's not, it's going to be a little while before he dies. But I think Jacob wanted to deliver this when he had, it was in a state of lucidity. Yes. And he, he had his wits about him and knew what he was saying. He didn't wait till the last minute to hope that he'd be conscious or something like that. He knew, I'm coming near to the end. I'm going to gather sons together. Gather yourselves together. I wasn't going to do this one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. See, this is man. This is man. Yeah. Man thinks this thing personal. They take this too far. Uh -huh. So they want to correct somebody. They take them. Take them aside personally. Well, if it's some kind of a personal trespass, I, that, that's right. You do it. But when it comes to instructing people, you don't, yeah. you don't send the kids back to the nursery the, and the others to the junior church and others someplace else. And Gather yourself. They weren't all at the same age, and they weren't all on the same level. Gather them all together. Why? Because each brother's going to benefit from what he hears about the other brother. See, it's... And beside that, we're going to hear it. Jesus did the same thing. When he got down to teaching, he called his disciples together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You through the gospel. See if this is the case. It's true there was Nicodemus and the woman at the well, but they were, they were exceptions. But what he told them was for everybody. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Jesus doesn't communicate private truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. 
If Jesus really told you something that's legitimate, it's for everybody. That's the way he taught. You know this is the case. This, this, that's why we have the why we have the Bible. Been whispered in the ear. You tell from the house. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's right. It was a public, was a public message. Mm -hmm. mm. Now I gather yourselves together that I may tell you what will befall you. <laughs> it's a prophecy. Mm -hmm. It. And Jacob knows it's a prophecy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, I'm not going to tell you what I, what I hope happens. I'm, mm -hmm. I hope this... Uh... See, Jacob, other times, he didn't talk like this. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Remember when they wanted... Joseph wanted to send me to stay down there, you remember? And mm -hmm. Jacob didn't want to send him there, and here's what Jacob said. Uh -huh. My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If, if, if mischief befall him, but there's no ifs in any of these prophecies Amen. we're going to read. Right. These were prophecies, right. no ifs. <clears throat> they were covenantal promises. He was speaking as one of the fathers through whom God was establishing his promises. God had told Abraham... that nations would come from him. Now, Jacob's going to open that up a little bit for us. And, and Jacob told Joseph that a multitude of nations would come from Manasseh. That's what he told him. None of these prophecies revealed the nature of these nations, just that they would happen. There was no if See, at Mount Sinai, there are a lot of promises given to Israel if, yes, yeah. if they kept the law, if they kept his commandments, then the things he said would come to pass. But this isn't the case here. It's a prophecy. Promise, there's a difference between promise and prophecy. They're not the same thing. A promise is contingent upon something. A prophecy is not. I'm sure you can see that. Now, here's another unique circumstance we're dealing with. Up to this time, the fathers, only a single seed. Mm -hmm. The promise is only passed on to a single mm -hmm. seed. With Adam, it was Seth. Mm -hmm. With Abraham, it was Isaac. And Ishmael, Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua were omitted. Just, just one. To Isaac, he only had two sons, but just one. Mm -hmm. Jacob, not Esau. But now Jacob has 12 sons, yeah. and all 12 of them mm -hmm. are involved. Yeah, amen. Why? Because we got to have some multiplication. Yeah. Yeah. we got to have multiplication. Yeah. So through Jacob, he has 12 sons, and he does have some that would be limited, but they were all, they were all included. I don't doubt that this is very confusing to the yeah. devil. <laughs> How does he figure this out now? Yeah. It was it was easy with with Abraham and Isaac, but how? See, this had, it, Satan's not omniscient, That's right. and God didn't divulge his purpose down to that fine a detail. Now two millennia have passed, and so far as he's, Satan's concerned, all he really knows is somebody's going to bruise my head. That, yeah. Yeah. That's all he knows. Mm -hmm. He knows the seed of a woman, so he's going to make some women barren, and he's going to try and get rid of them in some way. But that's all he knows. That's all, at this time, that's all he knew. Amen. Yeah. But it didn't discourage him. Mm -hmm. And if you have limited knowledge, it shouldn't discourage you. Go ahead and live for the Lord. Now, I'm going to let, tell you what will befall you in the last days. In the last days. Whoa, the last days. Yeah. Not next year. In the last days. 
This means that none of these sons' lineage was going to pass away before that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Yeah, right? What, mm -hmm. At least I'm going to tell you what would befall you. When he says you, he means the head of the mm -hmm. tribe and all the progeny. Yes. So I'm going to tell you, you you're going to be around mm -hmm. till the last days. So if someone says the Jews have disappeared, well, send them to Jacob. The seed of the woman, when he appeared, and during his reign, mm -hmm. see, the, that constitutes that this, the last days are not just when Jesus came. Yeah. Yeah. It's when he came and all through his, his reign, mm -hmm. these tribes are going to be here. Yeah, that's, right. that's the reason for the existence of the earth. Mm -hmm. And God's not going to... Let them be removed. There have been people trying to remove them. There's been a concerted efforts to remove the Jews, but it yeah. can't be done. The enthronement of Jesus ushered in the last days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a little chart here. The thing driving this whole thing is the purpose of God. See, that's what's driving this whole thing. Uh -huh. Then after the establishment of the purpose, mm -hmm. the creation of the world. Mm -hmm. See, and it the world's going to stay here to this yes, amen. Amen. purpose. Then there's a calling and the promises to Abraham. It was introduced, mm -hmm. built on the purpose of God, mm -hmm. the existence of the world. Mm -hmm. That purpose is going to continue on. Then the formation and continuance of Israel as a nation. That's all mm -hmm. within the, this eternal purpose. Mm -hmm. The enthronement of Jesus comes when Jesus entered heaven. The last day is commenced. Yeah. Uh -huh. There isn't going to be anything after this age Amen. in the world. In the world yeah. mm -hmm. And during this enthronement period, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen during that time. Now, the last phrase, the last days, occurs seven times in Scripture, and it represents an, an expression of pers divine perspective rather than in terms of time or length the thrust of the expression is not technically speaking from the standpoint of time mm -hmm. think of it as the last phase of the yeah, yeah, of the purpose as far as the earth is concerned when God's completed what he's doing there'll be no further need for the world yeah. consequently there'll be no further need for man or Israel or anything in the flesh yeah. And then the male elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth will be burned up because that's why it was here in the first place. So Jacob says, now gather, gather yourselves together now and hear. Now mm -hmm. Hear, you got to listen to what I'm saying. Hearken unto your father. Assemble together. Now if you're familiar with scripture, I, and I trust you are, if you aren't, you, then you want to get familiar with it. In Scripture, whenever there was speaking, the people were always listening. Yeah, amen. At Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. they listened. Yeah. Scared them, but they listened. Mm -hmm. When Solomon dedicated the temple, all the people listened. Okay. Yeah. When Elijah was having his contest with the prophets of Baal, the people listened. Yeah. When Ezra and Nehemiah brought the people together and read the Scripture, the people listened. Mm -hmm. When John the Baptist preached... The people listened. Peter preached at Pentecost. The people listened. When Stephen preached in the synagogue and they disputed, they listened. Philip preached in Samaria, they listened. When Paul preached, they listened, whether it was at a synagogue or at Athens. The people listened. Yeah. People have always listened mm -hmm. in Scripture. Sometimes they get angry. Sometimes they were convicted. Sometimes they were helped. Sometimes they were comforted, but they always listened. Amen. We're living in a society that has cultured a lack of attentiveness. Yeah, yes, Brother Jason. One observation I, I've had after going through Bible college and then seminary and studying a lot about preaching and reading a lot of books on preaching. 
almost all the modern homileticians and the books on preaching, they start out from an assumption that people don't want to listen to the preaching. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you have to, you know, you have to do a little sleight of hand. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole discipline of homiletics is kind of built on that. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's right. what. That's just that's a situation we have. You got people, people that don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is from, from, it's a, been cultured, but see, Satan's, this is an evidence of his hand. Yeah, He's created a circumstance, or man is a circumstance where people can't concentrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. So anything that requires co concentration mm -hmm. is on the wane, yeah. Yeah. even down to like cooking. Yeah. Yeah. Is that not the truth? Building, yep. whatever you use to take a lot of thought, it's it's a society that's not a concentration-oriented society. Amen. You can't think of the inner relationships of things, which if you do anything, if you're a cook, you have to know how this stuff fits together. Mm -hmm. it takes thought. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more, it's, thought is brought to its peak mm -hmm. in the things of God. Amen. So Jacob, he called me, Listen to what, because this is the kind of environment in which God will work, see. Yes, amen. If it's an environment where thoughts are wandering, you know, wandering around, God's not going to work in that kind of environment. Yeah, amen. If he did, they wouldn't know it. That's right. Going to gain the benefit of what Jacob's going to believe, he tells his sons, oh, listen. Mm. All right, we'll begin with Reuben. You're the firstborn. If anyone had the advantage, Reuben, you did. First people always have the advantage. The apostles were the first. Look at the advantage they had. They were set first in the church. Huh? First ones had the advantage. You're my firstborn. My might, my beginning, and my strength. He's his eldest son, born to him through Leah. He was a man who was given remarkable advantage at birth. Mm -hmm. It was a birth right. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Remarkable advantages that he had. Notice what he said. You're my strength. Mm. You are my strength, the beginning of my strength. What does he mean? When I conceived you, when I had, when you were born to me, I was at the peak of my mm -hmm. existence. You were my firstborn. You could be with me from these ambitions that I had, which were at their peak. Mm -hmm. You could do more. You could be more because you had the advantage of being with me. Mm -hmm. See, if a child's born and you're 60 years old, you know you don't run around the block. Mm -hmm. Your dad, man, that's yeah. the kind of thing it is. Mm -hmm. He had the advantage of these powers. He had more opportunity to be with and work with his father. Yeah, that's right. In this sense, he was more able to carry out Jacob's will. Jacob could have given him more to do, and he'd have done it. He, he sees hmm. the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity. There's something about hmm. being first. Yeah. Reuben was endowed with the right and capacity to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was one of his birthrights. He'd be a be a leader, lead out. Highest in rank. Those weren't goals. Those were rights. Yeah, yeah. Birth rights. Yeah, that's right. But he said, <laughs> you're unstable as water. Unstable as water. The idea is there was no stability or consistency yeah. in Reuben. He acted impulsively rather than thoughtfully. You couldn't depend on Reuben to do the right thing invariably. He brought mandrakes to his mother and laid with his father's concubine. He was the one that delivered Joseph out of his brother's hands. And he's also the one that said to his father about taking 
care of Simeon. He says, slay my two sons if I bring him not to these. <laughs> nice suggestion, huh? Unstable as water. You'll not excel. You had, we had every right, son, to expect you to excel. You had all the advantages. You're not going to excel. He would not be first in rank. He would not be preeminent. He would not be foremost. And he told him why. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiled thou it, he went up to my couch. That happened 40 years before this. 40 years. Hmm? Yeah. And his it narrowed down to one thing, just like it did with Adam. It right. narrowed down to one event. It's going to do the same thing with Simeon and Levi. It's going to narrow down to one occasion. Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't think one occasion can change mm -hmm. your history? Mm -hmm. If it hasn't, just give thanks to God, but it can. We have examples of this. He was a man whose life was a composite of unwise and contradicting uh, actions. So Jacob summarized them all. Unstable as water. You as well, you as well try and take a seat on a bowl of water. And expect it to hold you up. As to depend on Levi. I depend on Reuben. Yeah. Thou shalt not excel. You see, today, <clears throat> the church has a relaxed view of morality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. I know everybody does it, but most people do. Mm -hmm. Relaxed view of it. If God purged the early church of people that lied concerning how much they gave to the church... <laughs> yeah. I mean, how serious is it for the things that go on today to really happen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people may say, we love these people, we want the best for these people, all oh, baloney. I don't even believe that. I don't believe people when they say that. They're just simpletons. They're just belching out something they've been told. If sin doesn't offend people, something's bad wrong. Amen. It offends God, it offends Christ. That's right. When that kind of sin was on Christ, it wasn't pleasant for him. Then yeah. we see it, it shouldn't be pleasant for us, not at all. Yeah. Paul said, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you. Yeah. There's two things that that means. One is nobody in your congregation should commit it, and nobody should talk about it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's what once named means. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't be... Don't be talking about it. Uh -huh. You got to get up and give a testimony about what you were. Use guarded words. Don't you be spelling out the stuff Amen. you did before you were in Christ. It's not to be mentioned. Yes. Amen. Uh -huh. Why isn't it? Just because the law against it? Because it'll stir up yes. iniquity. Amen. That's why. So that's, uh, that's what we got to say to Reuben. Yeah. Next, Simeon and Levi. Their brethren, instruments of cruelty. Oh, oh my soul, don't go near them. Woo, yeah. Don't get involved with These are his sons. Yeah, yeah. These are his sons, mm -hmm. number two and number three. Mm -hmm. Don't go near them. Their brethren. He means they're... Two peas in a pod yeah, uh -huh. means they're they're like each they're like one another yeah. they're the same kind of people uh -huh. they're equally headstrong deceitful and vindictive and cruel the amplified Bible says yeah. the idea is that they thought and acted alike they were two people but they had one mind and one manner uh -huh. and they were instruments of cruelty. Yeah. Hmm. The road's cruelty and violence have to do with unlawful aggression. It's aggression that's not right. 
it's, we're not talking about warfare. If, if he, if God says destroy Jericho, yeah, you go in there and do violence. If he says drive the Canaanites out of the land, you go in there with violence and drive them out. See, but this is unlawful. Yeah. They're trying to settle something with cruelty that that's not the way it ought to be settled. The reference is to the response of Simeon and Levi to the molestation of their sister. They got angry about it. They killed all the men in the city of Shechem. Now, only one man did that. Killed all the men in that city, killed the man that did it, and killed his father too. And on top of everything, they did it by deceit. They trapped him. They said, if you're circumcised like us, then we can share, where you can marry our women and we can marry your women. And then when they had the after effects of circumcision, they went in there and just killed him. And it upset Jacob at the time. He said, you made me stink. Yeah. What a reputation we got now yeah. in this land. That also took place 40 years before this. I imagine they probably thought it was all over. Maybe they, maybe they were a little sorry or something. I don't know. But Jacob remembered it. He, remember, he's prophesying. Yeah. So I gather that the Lord alerted him. No, nah, okay, there's. We can't have people like this in the forefront of the messianic lineage. Yeah. I know Rahab was there, but it's after she was a harlot, not while she was a harlot. Amen. I know Ruth the Moabitess was in there. I know that, but it was after she was in Moab, not while she was in Moab. Yeah. We can't have this kind of people in the lineage of Jesus. Amen. Don't be united with them. That is, I don't, I don't trust their decisions, their kind of thinking. He's affirming that such conduct has no place among the people of God. People you can't trust, don't give them anything to do. I mean, you may think you're doing them a favor. I mean, I'd say, I speak as one who has, has tried this, and I can tell you it doesn't work. If someone can't be trusted, we just don't give them anything good to do, unless it's repent. Now, some of the versions, I wanted to read some of the versions here, which are, <laughs> I don't know where these people were educated, but I, I hold their education in doubt after I read some of these things, where it says they dig down a wall. Now, it's generally understood that it was the wall that surrounded the house is what they're talking about. But listen to some of these uh, translations. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Revised Standard. In their anger they slay men, and in their wantonness they hamstring oxen. In their wrath they put men to death, and for their pleasure e even oxen are wounded. These are Bibles I'm reading from. In their wrath they slew a man, and in their self-will dig down a wall. That's an older version, Geneva. Here's a New Living Translation. In their anger, they murdered men and they crippled oxen just for sport. Young's Literal Translation. In their anger, they slew a man and in their self-will eradicated prince. So see, that was, see, a little better. Here's a Living Bible. They murdered a man and maimed oxen just for fun. In anger, in their anger, they slew a man, an honored man, Shechem, and the Shechemites, and in their self-will, they disabled oxen. Yes, those are Bibles, though. Those are real Bibles. Mm -hmm. The translation of maiming animals comes from the Septuagint version, mm -hmm. which scholars on one hand tell you it's a weak mm -hmm. translation, then on the other hand, they use it to shape all kind of Bibles. Yeah are shaped by it. <clears throat> but I don't accept that because it doesn't harmonize with the text of Scripture. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bible translators should do us a service of at least reading the Bible. Amen. Amen. Mm 
which I get the distinct impression they don't. They just kind of go from word to word. Mm -hmm. Here's what the scriptures say in Genesis 34, 28, 29. They, they, that Simeon and Levi, they took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in their house. So they actually added their stock. Yeah. It's the, the stock they found to their own stock. Mm -hmm. Now these men would have done us a great favor if they would have just have read that right. and put it together. So I'm saying I doubt the integrity of these people yeah. that put out Bibles like this. Mm. That's just my own opinion. Mm -hmm. But it is a strong one, I'll tell you. What are we going to do about them, Jacob? They're going to be divided and scattered. They're not going to be able to work together yeah. anymore. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce. I'm going to disperse them. I'm going to scatter them and disperse them in Israel. I just... In the census taken in Numbers 26, which is before they went into Canaan, mm -hmm. the smallest tribe of all was Simeon, mm -hmm. 22,000, compared to Judah, which was 76,500. Mm -hmm. That's just a 20 years and up. Yeah. Some years later at Mount Sinai, just to show you God's a gracious God, mm -hmm. Moses sent out a call because they were worshiping the golden calf, whoever was on the Lord's side, bring, strap on your sword and start slaying these people that are worshiping this calf. And the tribe of Levi yeah. stepped up. Mm -hmm. 3,000 died that day. Some generations had passed. Mm -hmm. And God separated Levi. Yes. Made him the priestly tribe in charge of the tabernacle and everything that went on inside of it. Everything belonged to it. Great act of mercy it took place. Now, God told Moses that there was a limit to how many generations he cursed, up to three or four. Yeah. Uh, there were more generations, I think, than that here. But it shows you that enough was, enough was done. God overruled this, yeah. this curse. But they were still dispersed. Mm -hmm. They didn't have their own land. Remember, they were still, they're still paying the penalty. Mm -hmm. Now we come to the prophecy of Judah, which is, whoa, this is really good. Yeah. Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. Mm -hmm. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. I will read the rest, rest a little later. Now this is going to be heavy, heavily messianic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought it was well to take a moment here and establish the preeminence of Christ in Scripture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this point you're going to see a noticeable change in emphasis. It's going to, mm -hmm. it's going to sound different than, yeah. the, than the others. The spotlight is now is not turned on the tribes of Israel, but on the son mm -hmm. who shall be given to Israel. Yeah. And us a son is given, you know, so forth. The ultimate reason for Israel was the sending of the seed of woman. And here, yeah. for a first time in a long time, mm -hmm. something's going to be said about this yeah. coming seed. Mm Now make no mistake about this, there's no man, no angel, no body of people or objective of a person or group of persons that approximates the importance of the person and work of Christ. Yeah, yeah. He absolutely stands apart mm -hmm. from anything and everything and everybody Amen. else. He stands apart. Yeah, if there's some kind of a conflict mm -hmm. between what men want and what God wants through Christ, what Christ wants, Men have to defer to Christ. Yes. Amen. They, Amen. they have to. We're not suggesting this be done. Mm -hmm. If you don't bow now, you will bow then, and it yeah. will not be to your salvation. Amen. Amen. We need to Amen. tell people this. Right. Even if they don't believe it, you tell it to them anyway. Right. You have to bow to Jesus because he is preeminent. Yes. See, God's made him the preeminent one. So he is the most important point of Scripture. Yes. 
is Jesus Christ. Every competing thought and purpose will eventually have to yield to Christ. Now, you introduce them by saying, your brethren are going to praise you. See, they could have been praised. They could have praised Reuben had he not, you know, they're going to praise you. In fact, in this regard, he even trumped Joseph. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joseph got the birthright, mm -hmm. but he didn't get the praise. Yes. Ah, 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 how about that? Yeah. He got the birthright, but he didn't get the praise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus wasn't the lion of the tribe of Joseph, right. or the lion of the tribe of Ephraim, or the lion of the tribe of Manasseh. Mm -hmm. See? Judah. Yeah. You'll get the praise. Mm -hmm. In fact, the word Judah, the name Judah means praise. Mm -hmm. So you know he's talking about Christ here. Your father's brother, your father's children are going to bow down to you. You wait till the veil's lifted, and you'll find all these brothers' progeny are going to bow down yeah. to Jesus. <laughs> they're, going to, they're going to do it. The ultimately, see, the seed of Abraham and the seed of the woman is the fundamental focus of the fundamental view. Jesus is not just a figurehead. That's right. I think he's treated like a figurehead. You know, we have uh, company presidents used to retire, and they'd be the president emeritus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That means they really didn't run the company. But we, you know, so I think some people treat Jesus like a Jesus emeritus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't bow to him. Yeah. They're not living for him. Mm -hmm. They're not thinking about him. Mm -hmm. They're not following him or reading his word or thinking on what he said. He, they're treating him like a figurehead, but he's not. Yeah. He's not a figurehead. He really is the head over all. He really yeah, is. Right. Men don't doubt, bow. It's just because they don't see him. Mm -hmm. yeah. The one exalted by God has to be acknowledged. Yeah. Eventually, Every personality will acknowledge it. Amen. Now, during this day of salvation, we get the chance to do it, mm -hmm. the opportunity to do it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Judah, he's a lion's whelp. Mm -hmm. he not, no, he's not talking about this. Mm -hmm. Judah's a lion's a cub. How it gone up. Young lion, we've got it. Not a cub, a young lion. Mm -hmm. It's like a young lion that's full of meat. Mm -hmm. Kill the prey. And he's, uh, or maybe he drug it up to his lair up there at the top of the mountain. And he's, uh, he's conquered the foe, satisfied, resting up there. It's a picture of Jesus. See, this is a picture of Jesus. Yeah. Uh -huh. He's overcome the foe. Yes. Now he's resting. Amen. He's entered into his rest now. Yeah. And now Judah says, who's going to rouse him up? Oh, you don't want to get, you don't want to get him roused up. No. He's a young lion. Mm -hmm. Don't want to rouse him up. Who's going to cause him to rise up? See, it's a depiction, as I said, of a conquering Savior mm -hmm. who's thoroughly satisfied and must not be needlessly aroused or stirred up. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you've got a trouble with sin, mm -hmm. this lion has already addressed that. He's not going to do anything more about your sin yeah, right. than it's already done. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you've got to accept that Amen. and build on it. You yeah. can't ask him mm -hmm. to enter into your sinful situation and kind of, mm -hmm. he's already dealt with sin. Amen. And there's power in what he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you will come to him, the thing will be resolved by just, accepting what he's done Amen. and having faith in the atonement yeah. who will mm -hmm. rouse him up yeah. those who make war against him will only rouse him to action against them <laughs> this, hour, this marvelous prophecy the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come yeah. scepter is a scepter of rule an, an indication of rule Remember how that uh, Artaxerxes, Esther's husband, mm -hmm. 
Amen. You had to hold out the scepter, and that meant you could. Amen. Uh, I'll, I'll con concur with you being here. Yeah. The scepter, now remember, you see, your, your brethren are going to praise you. So he's got the scepter. Your yeah. brethren are going to bow down to you. Got the scepter. Till Shiloh come. Yeah. Then you're not going to have the scepter anymore. Scepter is going to pass to Shiloh. Who's who's Shiloh? Well, the word Shiloh means to whom it belongs. So he says, scepter is in your hand until the one who has the right to this scepter comes, and then you're going to give it to him. Yes, amen. Jesus has the right yeah. to rule, amen. to reign, to yeah. dominate, mm -hmm. to demand, to require. He's got the right to do so. Yes. Amen. See? Amen. And a scepter's been given to him. <laughs> Till Silo come. Well, I just held that out. Don't you know these men were hoping for that? <laughs> and unto him, says Shiloh, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Oh, he doesn't say that people had better gather to him or the people ought to gather uh -huh. to him or it'd be best that they get. So the people, the people, uh -huh. they'll gather to him. Well, that's another way of saying that God will draw them. That's right. Yeah. yeah. They will. The real people yes. mm. whom are known to God. The Lord knows them that are his. That's yes. categorically stated in 2 Timothy 2. The Lord knows them that are his. Yes. Those people will come to Christ. Amen. Because he's for them. Yes. He's particular theirs. Mm. To him shall a gathering mm. other people be. He would, he would, Jesus said himself, he'd draw, he said, if I, if I be lifted up, he's speaking about on the cross, lift it up. If I be lifted up, I will draw. That is, he's not going to send out an army to herd the men. <laughs> I'll draw him from the cross. He draws them. The drawing tool is the cross. That's where we. That's where his love is confirmed. Yes. Is at the cross. Amen. Yeah. And when you see the cross, right, you come, you flee to him for refuge. Yes. Unto him shall the gathering of the people. Yeah. See up to up to the time of our text, Abraham's seed were the people. Mm -hmm. In fact, God sent Moses to Pharaoh and said, "Let my people." Yeah. See, all people technically belong to him, but mm -hmm. by creation. But let my people, that was Israel. See, yeah. but then there's over and above Israel, there's the people. Yeah, amen. You know, come unto me. Yeah. Now that in the prophecy, he, as I understand, he switches from the Shiloh to Judah himself, his progeny. He's going to tell about the fertility of Canaan in, Jews, in Judah's portion of it. Binding his foal into the vine, his ashes colt to a choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Well, to briefly summarize this, what it means is the fruitage will be so luxurious and the vine so strong that you can tie up a bird, an animal of a burden and tie him to the vine. Normally, you don't uh, like tie an ox to a grapevine. Yeah. And a colt, just what a colt, then the the, the colt of the ass, you'll tie it to one of the one of the vines that are coming out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just like a sturdy mm -hmm. fruitage that was going to happen, mm -hmm. and the, the juice is going to be so abundant, like you could wash your clothes in it. It'd be so. He's not talking about the color and all that. He's talking about the abundance of it. You, you know, when you wash your clothes, you don't wash your clothes in a cup of water. Yeah. At least most people don't. Yeah. You use a lot of water. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. In other countries, they go to, to rivers and to mm -hmm. canals, and with bit, that's where they wash. So that's what he says. There's going to be such an abundance of juice in these grapes that yeah. you could wash your clothes in it. If, it, if, it, if your clothes would be cleansed by grape juice, you, and it, it's going to be so much for the ox and the ass, you know, his eyes would be red from having so much grape juice. And his teeth would be white from drinking so much milk. Mm -hmm. See, that's what he says. It's not such a super abundance. And he's kind of putting it down in parabolic language yeah. Amen. for them. <laughs>
So Judah will experience a special blessing in the land. Now God told God told Israel later about what he could do in that land. Here's what he said. The Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths of, that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, and a land of oil, olive, and honey. Again, he said, For the land whither thou goest to possess it is not as the land of Egypt, which was pretty, yeah. pretty fertile. Ye came out of where thou sowest thy seed and waters to with thy feet as the garden of earth, but the land where ye shall go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. Yeah. Amen. And Judah got the best of that. <laughs> and then again he said, I'll give you the rain in your land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain. That is, I'll get the seed started growing, and I'll send a ladder in to bring the harvest on. And thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil, and I will send grass. I will send grass. I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, and that thou mayest eat and be full. So see, that's that's the kind of thing he's promising. Judah, yes abundance that you're speaking about I've been thinking of Ephesians and all the references it has to spiritual superlatives in chapter 1 we are blessed with all spiritual yeah. blessings in heavenly places in Christ mm. in verse 7 we have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace mm -hmm. and he's able to do far abundantly yeah. over what we can ask or Amen. even think so this, mm -hmm. this abundance is being channeled into Christ's people Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Amen. See, it's a depiction of the the uh, Shiloh is Christ, mm -hmm. but we're like Judah. Yeah, uh -huh. yes, amen. You see, we 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 get the blessing like Judah. Uh -huh. Now there's a, there's a there's a difference here mm -hmm. between what God promised Israel and what God promised Judah. Mm -hmm. Israel's promise was contingent upon their obedience. Mm -hmm. it said if you. But this promise isn't contingent upon anything. Amen. This promise to Judah is not qualified. That's right, yeah. It's a unilateral. Yeah. It, it blends in with the Abrahamic covenant. Amen. That's right, yeah. You know, there's two ways that the fathers are used in Scripture. One is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the fathers. And the others is when the, Sinai, the covenant was made at Sinai, that group of people is called fathers. This is the first fathers that we're talking yes, about here. The, the covenant made with the fathers at Sinai was a conditional mm -hmm. covenant. Yeah. This is not conditional. This is an appendage mm. to the Abrahamic covenant. Mm. And then I list there some uh, parallels, some abundant mm. things about the kingdom, exceeding in riches and abundant and fullness and completeness, and mm. exceeding. I, I, I exhort you as, as well as I can to not settle for anything from God that's small yeah. mm -hmm. Amen. and little. Amen. I, even, I even admonish you to make particular friends with people that think in this larger... Mm. I have a desire that all men be saved. Mm. I do. But I really don't want to be around midgets. And Jacob didn't either. Yeah. Okay. And if you have some of my friends that are, do your best to grow them up. Don't you be accommodating to that midgethood. Yeah. Contribute to the genuine people of God. They'll be thankful you did. Because yes. the fellowship's at the high level, not the low level. You yes. all can see that, guys. Uh -huh. that. You're, the, the higher the fellowship is, the more extensive it is. Mm -hmm. The lower the fellowship it is, the less extensive mm -hmm. it is. Then he gives the prophecy to Zebulon, Zebulon, Zebulun. Mm -hmm. 
Now, one thing I appreciate about acquaintance with a text like this, you see the minuteness of God as well as the largeness of it. Zebulun was, well, you don't know much about Zebulun, and his territory was very small. It's just like Canaan itself was kind of small, just a little, little piece of land for Zebulun. It was extremely small. You compare the territory of Zebulun with Judah, and Manasseh had two big chunks of land, and you compare Zebulun with either Manasseh or Judah, well, it's like you could add it to those two, and it wouldn't be anything. But there was land allotted yeah. to him. And it, it doesn't match the land that was assigned by Joshua. Mm -hmm. And some people say there's mistakes in the Bible and so forth. As I understand it, that Israel never did occupy all the land promised to them. Mm -hmm. David, we understand, took tribute from the largest part. But we're talking about the largest part to be inhabited. And you remember God told him he's going to bring them back to the land? Mm -hmm. It's my persuasion they'll occupy the, yeah. the whole land. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And they were going to be a ha haven of the sea. They're going to be near the seashore. Mm -hmm. Be between two seas. One is the Sea of Galilee, one is the Mediterranean. They were in, be in between here. And ships would dock there and maybe load, unload. Yeah. Haven there for during bad weather or whatever, and uh, that's about it. That's I wasn't satisfied with anything else I could learn about Zebulun, so I'm just going to let it. Mm -hmm. That's all. Is it mentioned in the prophecy in Isaiah? Oh yes, I know. Zeb Zebulun and Naphtali by the way of the sea, right. Galilee the Gentiles, yeah. the people mm -hmm. set in darkness, the sea that's of right. light. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So see that's. As far as the inheritance is concerned, we just wouldn't know anything else. And you can't find two maps that are alike. Another thing. But it, this, is in the, this is in the ultimate sense, as I understand it. In the prophecy of Issachar, I think this is the last one. Issachar is a strong ass. Couching down between two burdens, and he saw that rest was good. He saw that rest was good. And the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto tribute. Now here again, we have this translator problem. Couching down between two burdens. Let's see how the scholars read that. Lying down between two burdens. Lying down between two sheepfolds, lying down between two saddlebags, crouching down between two sheepfolds, stretched out among the flocks, bedded down inside the village hearths, couching down between two hurdles, lying down between the borders, resting between the inheritances, resting between two saddlebags or campfires, resting among the saddlebags, take rest, taking rest between the lots, resting in the meadows. He will lie down under this heavy load, crouching between the corrals. Well, no wonder people don't understand the Bible. Excellent exposure to the absolute confusion caused by translators. All supposedly drawing on the original language, which, quote, is the key to understanding the Bible. Now, I take it that the emphasis here is on strength, a strong... The emphasis isn't on lying down. The emphasis is on a strength between two burdens. All right, you picture a donkey with have these set, these uh, carry a load with a burden on the left and a burden on the right. That's what he's talking about. He was a crouching down between them. He was a heavy, it was a heavy load. But he saw it was good. It, it, it said, uh -huh. He saw that rest was good. He said, like, this, isn't, this isn't so bad. I can, I can handle this. The environment's, environment's pretty good. So I consent to be a servant. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, nobody would mind being a servant if the circumstances were good. That's what he's talking about. What he's saying, Issachar was asked to carry a heavy load, but he was given some rest and it was pleasant. He said, I kind of like this. I'll, I'll consent to be a servant. Well, there you have it. A glorious depiction of serving Christ. Yes. It, right there it is. Yeah, Take my yoke upon you. Yeah. Come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. You'll find rest. Mm -hmm. And when you do, you do the same thing Issachar did. Yes. You'll consent to be in a servant. Amen. Amen. That's the secret, brethren. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the secret. Yeah. This rest, this uh, lasting and invigorating joy that you have with, in serving. You have fellowship with Christ. You have communion with the Holy Spirit. And you have the joy of walking with others that are in the light. And that experience makes serving Jesus with all the blessings that he gives you thrown in, like peace of mind and joy of the Holy Spirit and things like that, makes it a joyful experience to serve Christ. Yes. Amen. And if he gives you a lot to do, just crouch under the burden. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and think about what's going to come along with that extra Amen. obligation. Is going uh -huh. to, to whom much is given, much is required, and then much will be given back. Amen. Back to them. Well, that's uh, a little bit from that text. I I have a, a growing appreciation for Jacob. He's got kind of a bad shake. These were his sons. I imagine some of this was difficult to actually say. But see, he loved God more than he, yes. even his, his own sons. So this is a word he had. God gave him to God gave him to deliver this word. He didn't say, "No, I'll let let one of the women tell him this." So they were a little more sensitive, you know. He told them they all had to hear it. Yeah. They all sitting there, and they all had to remember what Reuben did. Yeah. Uh -huh. They all had to remember what Simeon and Levi did. Uh -huh. yes. And I imagine a few of them said, "Well, you know." If it wasn't for God, we'd have probably done the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So have that sort of attitude when you happen to hear about the yes. misfortunes of someone else. Mm -hmm. Don't delight in listening to it. Learn from it. Learn from it. Yes. Learn from it. Amen. I think I've told you this probably a hundred times. Sister Becky McCormick, we were having a testimonial service in Indiana. And some of the brethren had come from pretty bad backgrounds. So they were telling, they didn't go into details, but they told about them. And Sister Becky said, praise God, I was delivered from that too. <laughs> yeah, the first couple of times we didn't think anything about it. Pretty soon we began thinking, man, I didn't know. I didn't know Sister Becky was that kind of person. Yeah. They, so it was pretty bad stuff. And the Lord, did, did, she'd say, praise God, I was delivered from that too. We got all, got all through. Someone asked Sister Becky about it. She said, "Oh, she says I didn't do those things. I was delivered from them." Yeah. <laughs> Amen. That's Amen. that's how to that's how to assess yes. people that come from a low background uh, into Christ. That's how you Amen. God's kept you from it. Yes, that's right. So that this person can teach you. Yeah, Sister Barb. Something I was also thinking about about those two circumstances was that they were remembered for those times and occasions because it hadn't been redeemed mm -hmm. by anything else that mm -hmm. they had done or you know, forgiveness that they had given and things like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. When thinking about Judah and the prophecy that he gave there, he just continues to add. To yeah. kind of add more upon what he's already spoken and increase and enlarge yeah. upon this prophecy, mm -hmm. the promise given. 
And so you see the progress. You continue to see the beginning of the prophecy, and he continues to go farther yeah. and add to it. Amen. We see that that then is what we can have in redemption. Then Amen. Whenever that point of the prophecy, we, we receive Christ, then it begins, then we can make progress away from what was in the past. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no known limit. Just to that passage. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is a this is a good picture of the day of judgment. <laughs> yes, amen. And, and so That's good. when you hear yeah. what what he gave to to mm. Judah and the rest of of the of the twelve, then it, it spurs you on to mm. want to live as unto the Lord. Amen. We talk a lot about that. That's been brought up a lot lately. Is everything we do, we want to do it heartily as unto the mm. Lord. This is why, because we're living in view of the day of judgment. Amen. And we Amen. don't want to have to have the Lord bring up these things that are very shameful. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, Brother Jason. Yeah, a couple of other additions to Judah and Issachar. The yeah. Judah, the prophecy about the the vine there it reminded me Jesus said I'm the vine yeah. you're the branches he says I, I've appointed you to bear much fruit the, the reign of Christ is going to be fruitful yeah amen fruitful. and then Issachar it says he spoke there of this this uh, he laid down and rest yeah and rest you know under the burden the uh, it says there is a Sabbath rest yeah, for the people remains. of God. The yeah. Salvation by faith is entering into rest. Amen. Amen. It doesn't mean you don't do anything, but you, mm -hmm. but it, you rest. You don't mind doing it. Mm -hmm. yes. When you when you have this rest, yes. mm -hmm. Amen. you consent. Amen. I'll be a servant. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yes, brother Tony? I was talking about Simon and Levi. You know, they... They wasn't reluctant to take that sword in there. And it was it's kind of peculiar of all the tribes to yeah. come to Moses' call. It was the tribe of Levi to yeah. take that sword. Mm -hmm. I he thought, used it right that time. Yeah. But that's right. Right. And this time, though, <laughs> they were blessed for it. That's right. But the, it still showed their nature, you know, to be quick to go mm -hmm. ahead and that's right. do what they thought they needed to be done. Yes. You know. That's right. Yeah, if anybody thought the, the, the priesthood was a was made up of weak people. They didn't know what <laughs> Levi was capable of. <laughs> yeah, they, they, employed their, they employed their weapons. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, one other thought on, on prophecy to Judah. We're, we're getting ready to celebrate the resurrection, so yeah. mm -hmm. we should remember that the first time the resurrection was preached publicly, mm. he mentioned the Davidic covenant. That's right. Yeah. And, that's that, right. and that traces, that goes right back to this prophecy to Judah. Amen. Uh -huh. yeah. So that God would make, it almost like the prophecy to Judah is almost anticipating what God would later right. say to David. I'll build you a house, uh -huh. set one of your descendants on your throne forever. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, that's been fulfilled. Yeah. yeah. In the resurrection of Christ. I think I have that in here, but I Amen. forgot to make a point there. Thank you for bringing it up. Because on uh -huh. Pentecost, the brethren praised Right. David was from the tribe of Judah. Uh -huh. That's 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 the immediate. That's the non-Christ person that they bowed down to, mm -hmm. David. And in, when David became king, it said all the people bowed down to him. Mm -hmm. That that mm -hmm. point is made. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. When you think of the ramification of one sin. Yeah. It makes you very thankful for the Lamb of God that takes oh, away amen. all the sin amen. of the world. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this record. We see how that the fullness of the Godhead could only dwell in Christ bodily. And so you disperse various qualities in a host of other people to introduce us to the extensive nature of salvation. And we consent to be like Issachar. We choose to be your servants, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>